You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Architect Podcast, Episode 4. I'm your host, Russell Eileen Willem. Today on the show, my co-host Doug and I talk with Eric Kanza and Sarah Wittrick Kanza about their work with Open Context, Open Science, and sharing dual archaeological data. Eric, would you please give our listeners a little background about yourself and your current project? Hi, thanks, Russell. Um, yeah, so I direct Open Context, which is a data publishing venue for archaeology. And my background is um, mainly from Near Eastern archaeology. So I started out as an undergrad uh, working my first field school in um, the Negev Desert of Israel. And in grad school, I was working in Israel and in Egypt and a bit in Jordan and Turkey. Um, doing uh, research in the early Bronze Age. And I sort of, uh, while I was doing that, I shifted gears doing, um, getting really interested in uh, digital data and archaeology. And after I finished my PhD in uh, 2001, um, uh, we started really focusing on uh, the needs of uh, data sharing in archaeology. Great. Thanks for that, Eric. Sarah, would you mind giving a little bit about your background and some of your current projects? Sure, yeah, hi, and thanks for having me. Um, so I also started my research um, in grad school working in Israel in the Negev Desert. <laughs> you can see the link then between the two of us. That's actually where we met and started sort of talking about these things. Um, I ended up going into zooarchaeology, and I worked mostly in Israel and then moved into Turkey and worked there for 15 years um, on a Neolithic site. And over the course of that time, Eric and I started talking about our frustrations about um, access to data and the data that we were producing, um, the future of it, where it was going to end up or not end up, <laughs> as the case was. And um, that's where we got sort of the, the seed of the idea for the Alexandria Archive Institute was really born back in about the year 2000, where we um, decided that it was um, time for us to try to um, put something together that would help people um, provide access to the data that they worked so hard to collect and that would then just languish in general. So um, we started, founded this nonprofit organization and then several years later um, the idea of Open Context was born out of that nonprofit organization um, and it has become the main um, focus of our research efforts with the Alexander Archive Institute is focusing on getting funding for Open Context to help people publish their data openly in order to provide access to it. Could you guys tell us a little bit more about what Open Context is? Obviously, we're going to put a, a link in the show notes so people can check it out. Um, but could you tell us a bit about how it works and who sort of puts their data on it? Yeah. Um, so what Open Context is, is a um, so we call it a data publishing venue. And um, the way it works is that it's basically a, a, a giant database, and it has a very generalized kind of a, um, a back-end data structure, data model, or schema. And um, that uh, allows us to publish um, very disparate kinds of research data that archaeologists create. So. Um, you know, archaeologists work in all sorts of different kinds of uh, regions, uh, time periods. They work with very different kinds of materials. And um, in order to sort of handle the, that wide sort of diversity, we have to have a pretty generalized kind of uh, a system in the back end. And it is um, uh, by doing that, um, we can also index everything, make it all cross searchable. And increasingly, what we do is a lot more in the way of a uh, link data annotation that makes these different data sets um, cross references them with one another so that um, there are more meaningful linkages across these different databases. So the data sets that we get are coming from us, coming to um, us from field researchers who have sent us basically Excel spreadsheets for the most part. Um, sometimes people send us relational databases like an access or FileMaker or something like that and uh, big image archives. And what we do is we um, map these different data sets um, into our own system. We have a data cleanup stage where we um, review the data set, try to make them more um, consistent. And we link them up to these uh, linked data standards that allow them to be uh, cross-referenced across one another. And then we publish them. And when we publish them, they're web resources that you can link to 
every individual pot shirt or bone or whatever is its own individual web resource that has a stable identifier. And um, when we do that, then we um, finally put that into a digital library. It goes into the California Digital Library, which is the main university repository for the University of California. And um, that acts as our preservation repository. Uh, we, we don't have the capacity ourselves to um, preserve things for the long term. And I'd actually like to add something about the, who the sort of users are. Um, we have tried to keep it very flexible and open because this is all sort of a brave new world in, you know, in data sharing and data publishing. And open context is actually, I think that concept was a little ahead of its time and the technology, it, more and more technologies are emerging that are making it more and more sort of the vision I think that we had for it um, in terms of linked data and you know ontologies and that kind of thing. And so, um, but in terms of data publishing, uh, there's sort of the question about what that is and how that looks to people. And so we have tried to keep it very open in terms of, um, we, we will take like large field projects that have a whole bunch of different types of diverse data. We will also work with like graduate students or single um, individual researchers if they have one data set they want to publish. Um, we'll work with them on that. We have a, several projects that are um, specifically to link data sets with like chapters and books or with specific publications. And so those are maybe of a slightly different type of um, nature. And so it's about, we've tried to leave it open to be flexible to accommodate the different types of ways that people want to share data because there's no really set idea of what data sharing is. Now, data publishing, something very new. How, so if, if for a listener who does not, have never done this before, how is it very similar to, let's say, publishing an article, or how is it very different? Um, do you guys do peer review for these data sets, or do you just do your sort of cleanup, and then it's out there for anyone to try to use? Yeah, that's a good question, and um, and this is also one of these things that is, um, we're, we're honestly, we're, we're trying to sort through what data publishing really means um, and, and, the, and, the, and how to do the process well, um, because this is a really new kind of a thing. And um, the, the, the fundamental need that we do see is that some sort of, um, there needs to be some ways that um, contributing researchers who have data need to work with um, other people to, um, and it's a sort of co-production um, uh, with co-production between the researchers who can submit the data and the and us sort of an editorial team to work with them on um, improving the quality of that data and and aligning it to expected standards um, that is um, that's the sort of the fundamental need and that's where it's very similar in some ways to conventional publishing where when you publish an article you know you submit a you submit an article to a journal or um, or, or a manuscript for a book um, it goes through an editorial process that um, also involves really collaboration between different people who have different roles, right? So somebody producing the content, other people with editorial expertise, um, sometimes that's copy editing, sometimes it's more thematic editing to sort of talk, make it fit some sort of um, expectations of quality and standards. So data need the same kind of thing. They really need that kind of investment, uh, and it's an int intellectual investment also. Um, but um, as far as how peer review goes and all that, that that's something that um, needs to be a little bit different, I think, for data. Um, we're, we don't want to sort of filter for impact, which is what a lot of journals do. You know, so if you get submit a paper to Nature or Science or something like that, they might say that, well, it's scientifically fine, but it's not very interesting, and they'll reject it. Uh, data, I think, doesn't need to work that way. I think data is best when it's when it is shared, the impact might be far downstream and it could be, if anything, just expanding like sample size or statistical power for future meta-analyses that sort of use lots of data together. Uh, so we don't want to reject a data set because we think it's boring. Um, and that, so that's a different kind of a thing. So peer review around data needs to focus much more on uh, how well a data set sort of meets the kinds of expectations of um, what people need to um, what people uh, need to see in terms of documentation and understanding that data, um, and if the data seems to have any sort of um, 
big methodological problems or some gaps in documentation. That's what peer review is intended for. And it's, again, for us, it's mainly for um, trying to work with the researcher who submits the data to improve that rather than just sort of reject it. You guys had mentioned linked data. Now, is that linked inside of open context or do you guys have linked data out to other databases or other repositories or do people have people linked into you and are um, using your data and maybe another project on a different website? Um, I think so just to explain a little bit. Yeah. So the the essential bit about linked data that's really important is um, the notion of referencing different concepts or other kinds of entities, like a record about a bone or a potsherd, um, with a web identifier, a stable web identifier, so a web URI. And um, when you when you do that, um, when you when you publish data that has stable web URIs for different entities and different concepts, and those concepts could be terms in a controlled vocabulary, or they could be um, they, they could be records of individual bones or potsherds or whatever, um, then um, you can cross-reference different data sets across the web. So it allows you to do data integration on a web scale, which is really cool. But then it also works within open context. So I guess a concrete example of that is with the zooarchaeological data that we've been working with recently, a project in Turkey where we integrated um, over a dozen data sets from the Neolithic, um, around, around the Neolithic period, um, people recorded species names in different ways. And one of our um, aims is that we do not want to force people to standardize the way that they record their data. So I'm not going to make people call a wild sheep Ovis orientalis, even though that is the Latin name for it. Some people might just say wild sheep. Some people might say Ovis uh, o orientalis. Some people might have a code that they use for it. And there's all these different ways that people might record that particular species in their data sets. What we do then as part of the editorial process with Open Context is we can take all of the different ways that people have referred to that particular species and we can use a, um, an authoritative identifier. And what we did with the taxa is we used the Encyclopedia of Life, um, which provides concepts for different species. And so we can then link um, that those different um, descriptions of, of wild sheep to the authoritative link that, that describes wild sheep. And so within open context, then those data sets are linked. And then also with anything else on the web that references that concept, it's also linked. So it does internal as well as, as beyond open context linking. Yeah, absolutely. So to answer your question, yeah, we, we um, make linked data or linkable data. And we also reference other people's databases of linked data in a way to annotate the data that we publish to sort of flesh out the meaning. And it, um, in, in that way, it makes the data more intelligible and also more interoperable with um, uh, data, that, other data that's in open context, but also other data that anybody else is publishing on the web. So it's it really intended to try to make sure that um, the data in open context is related to that bigger ecosystem of information that is the World Wide Web. So how did you guys come up with this idea of making a well essentially all this linked data putting it on the website open context uh was there sort of a a single moment or is this sort of a long-term thing that you guys have been thinking about and eventually ended up doing there was a single moment <laughs> we actually remember it we were i mean the very beginning of it it was like in 2000 right we were yeah. driving down the freeway 580 going to eric's parents house and we were talking about this, what I mentioned earlier about the frustration of having collected so much data for our dissertations. And wouldn't it be great if there was a place you could go to access that data and the data other people have collected so that it would save time in doing your research. And we, that's where it was born. We decided we need to create a place where this kind of thing can happen. And obviously over the years, it, it changed and morphed in very significant ways. Um, the idea of data publishing came many years later. Right. And it really came as a result, I mean, for us, as a result of having started working with researchers to publish their or to share their data and realizing they had a lot of needs and a lot of concerns about the way their data was visualized and the way other people would access it. And it's not just about throwing data on the web. And then as we started working with them, we realized it's also not just about making sure you've got your spreadsheet archived, because in fact, 
in the end, it may not be very usable if you haven't um, gone through an editing process and a process to assure that people can actually understand it. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that, that was it. I mean, the other thing is just personal stuff that, you know, we were, um, we really wanted to live in the San Francisco Bay area. Uh, my parents are out here. Um, Sarah's parents are out here. Um, we wanted to have kids and, um, the sort of option of going for a sort of tenure track archeology span jobs was just not that attractive. Uh, because you obviously don't have a lot of wiggle room in where you're going to live. <laughs> you could just okay. get a job if, you, if you're if you lucky enough to get a job. And two people with PhDs in Near Eastern archaeology, you know, yeah. there aren't so many jobs. <laughs> so, so we really wanted to try to do something that gave us a little bit more agency about uh, where we could locate ourselves and um, also um, this kind of thing about focusing on data, I think is still really hard for people to do in mainstream ac academic positions. It's, it's really um, not those kinds of, that kind of professional world just doesn't suit well for a focus on uh, digital outcomes of, you know, doing stuff like software, playing with data, that kind of thing is just still very difficult for people to do within conventional academia. All right, I'm here with Jordan Harbinger from The Art of Charm, and he's going to tell us what The Art of Charm podcasts are all about. Go ahead, Jordan. Hey, sure. So thanks for the opportunity. Basically, what we do at AOC, this is the show that we wish we had 10 years ago, and I'm 34 now. So there's a lot of folks that are 20s and 30s, and we, we look at how we live our lives and the way that we do things. And it's always, it's always that, if I had known, if I had only known. So... What I'm doing with The Art of Charm and what we're doing as a team here is we bring together the best minds in pretty much every industry to teach people how to crush it in life with their relationships, at work, etc. So it's like having a mix of experienced mentors teaching you their expertise and packing all their research and testing and tough lessons, school of hard knocks or otherwise, into a curriculum. And we're very practical, which is great for your sort of scientific audience as well. Yeah, absolutely. This is great for networking, for uh, just learning some some personal skills that you can use on the job and uh, and for finding jobs and, and your relationships with people. Yeah. So we talk th about things like we talk about things like body language, the way you sit, stand, walk and talk, networking, how to follow up with the network, how to be authentic when you're creating relationships for work, because a lot of people think networking is like, here's my business card. Give me a call when you want to buy a used car. And it's like, no, it's about giving. It's about relationships. But since people don't have a game plan, they kind of ignore it. And especially in your field, they're probably thinking, oh, I really hope my work stands up for itself someday and I get that promotion. And it's like, well, it's all about who you know. And you can either say, oh, it's all about who you know and I hate that. Or you can be like, thank goodness it's all about who you know because I'm never going to be the top of this industry until, I, until it's too late for me to care, right? <laughs> right, right. All right, so go check out the Art of Charm podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you download podcasts, and you can find them also on www.theartofcharm.com. I believe Russell has a question. Yeah, so Eric, it sounds like both you and Sarah found out through your own dissertation work that you needed data sets or that you wanted to make yours more available to other researchers. Um, how did you find out about the web standards and about ways that you could use these open web standards to share your data, not only with other archaeologists, but kind of interoperate with other data sets like the Encyclopedia of Life? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, and this is and this is where we've gone through so many iterations. So um, open context, the, 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 the site that's up now is basically in its third major revision. And I'm doing another major revision um, right now. Um, and it's got, um, and, so, and so we've been sort of always sort of trying to follow what's going on on the web, but also with more um, other kinds of archaeological, I guess, informatics kinds of uh, uh, approaches. And um, what we initially started was that we were going to be using um, a system that was at the University of Chicago called XSTAR, and then it became Ochre which is um, uh, a system that's being developed there that is very sophisticated archaeological data management. And um, uh, Ochre is really powerful. Uh, David Schloan, who is the um, one of the sort of conceptual architects behind it, is um, on our board of directors. And um, 
it uh, well, but when we um, wanted to use it and, and, and for some of the archaeology work that we were wanting to um, share, um, it wasn't ready yet, and we had grant deadlines. And so, uh, but, but it was also a, a bit of a different kind of a vision. So ochre is very useful for sort of active data management, creating data, doing research with the data. Um, what we wanted to do more was focus on the dissemination side. And this is back in like 2006, 2007. Um, and there wasn't a lot around. And um, so what we did was we took the um, important conceptual bits of Oak, the, 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 the schema, the organization of the data, and uh, we implemented that um, in a MySQL database with PHP, and that was the original open context. And so we um, are still very interested in a lot of the um, kinds of information organization uh, uh, approaches that Ochre and other researchers are developing. Um, now we're much more uh, working with uh, linked data. Um, a lot of the uh, new version of Open Context is retaining um, some of the key data structures that we got from Ochre with their, the, the, their system. Um, their organization was called ArcuML, or the Archaeological Markup Language. Um, they're not using that term anymore, but um, the key ways of organizing the information that they developed were retaining, but we're also using more in the way of linked data to reference controlled vocabularies, ontologies, um, and other data sets that other people are publishing, um, not just at the University of Chicago, but um, lots of different places around the web. So there's a lot of iteration with this, and this is one of the key things is that um, you're never really done. <laughs> Uh, playing with this because the world of standards is constantly evolving, expectations change, technologies change, and so it really is um, very much a full-time effort to try to keep up with all this. And I think keeping up means, um, I mean, Eric, at least it seems that it's it's really about sort of keeping your finger on the pulse of like the digital humanities community and what's happening um, in those areas. And so it's... It, 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 being aware of these changes that are happening and thinking about how we might implement these various um, new technologies is, is very important to sort of not become, um, you know, cemented in one approach. Yeah. And if there's some listeners out there who want to submit something to open context, do you have both advice for before you submit it and then some advice for how to, what the process is about and how to do it, you know, how to make it run smoothly when they do uh, submit something to you guys? Sorry, wanna... Sure. So, um, so yeah, we we do have uh, on our website we have advice about um, sort of tips and, and good practices for how to prepare your data for being on the web, um, and we also have a project cost estimation form that actually when someone fills it out just to get an idea of what what how much sort of publication and archiving of their project might cost. Um, and this is especially for like NSF. Um, applicants because NSF requires a data management plan. Um, and so we, we offer this, this estimation form on open context for people to fill out. Then that, when you do that estimation form, it's not a commitment, it's just an estimation. And you get an email that gives you a lot of tips about things to put in your data management plan and also about ways to work with your data to help um, make it easier to, to publish. Um, so, and but that's a lot of we've been working with researchers a lot, and what has emerged in um, working with people firsthand on publishing their data and doing the back and forth editorial process to prepare their data for publication is that we and and researchers also are starting to realize that their um, things that they had assumed were sort of common practices or standard approaches actually aren't, and um, the way people implement different standards or different um, methodological approaches actually varies pretty wildly across the researcher community. And it's something that nobody really noticed looking at their summarized data and their, and their, their summary tables that they put in publications. You know, you cite your, your well, I'm using the method of whoever you cited and everyone goes, okay, great, I know that method, I understand these data. Well, actually it turns out that people make their own little tweaks and changes to it or they sort of interpret the methodology a little differently. And so when you start looking at, at their actual data sets, um, these differences emerge and some, we have heard people say, wow, you know, I would have never thought of doing it that way and I really like that approach. And so what we're thinking is that over time, um, new sort of approaches and new standards will emerge that are 
a lot better informed and that the research community will um, be able to do a lot more sort of valid and realistic comparisons across data sets. I think that's a really good point because as we, you know, publish data, one of the things that we're also publishing are the ways that people organize their data. And that modeling aspect of um, archaeological research, the way that you organize your information has been really um, just very informally done under, you know, background thing. Nobody ever cared to look at it. Nobody really talked about it too much. And as more data gets published and shared, then um, the ways that people organize and model their information become really critical for future downstream uses of those data. And there are good ways of modeling data. There are some not so great ways of modeling data. And I think that this is one of the um, ways that uh, not just sharing the data, but sharing the models is actually one of the interesting areas where um, this new frontier of open data is actually going to help advance the discipline. So, uh, Sarah, it sounds like you have both learned quite a bit about the culture of archaeology and archaeologists from just having collected people's data and finding out some assumptions maybe they had that weren't shared by other colleagues. Could you speak maybe a little bit more about any other cultural obstacles to sharing data or to getting people to agree on a standard or whether they even should be standards in archaeological data? Yes, that's an it's an interesting topic. Um, when you mention standards, people like either seethe or they nod their heads eagerly. You know, it's people have very different ideas about um, the use of standards. And this the idea of the approach of using linked open data to facilitate um, ties across or links across data sets has been wonderful because it has helped us have that conversation about standards without having to move toward some kind of agreement about standards um, because, you know, it, this kind of solves that problem that you don't have to tell people we're going to, we're insisting that you change the way you do things. Um, so another thing working with um, people on data sharing is um, sort of people's willingness to, to share data. It's been really interesting um, because in the beginning, when we first started doing this, people always said to us, oh, of course, the grad students do it right, but the older people don't. Or, or they said, oh, of course, the older people do it, but the grad students don't. Everyone had their sort of assumptions about who would be eager to share data and who wouldn't. And over the years, it's been, for us, it, it really seems more like it's about the person and their sort of confidence in their work and their um, um, sort of eagerness to get their data out there. It's, it, it hasn't been about their juniorness or their seniorness or whatever. Um, it's just been sort of person to person. Um, and it seems almost more personality based. Having said that, it's, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who are still very anxious about, about publishing their data or sharing their data, but there are so many people who want to do it that right now we're just happy, happy working with the people who, who want to share data and um, learning about data sharing in that process. And I think eventually it's just it's becoming so sort of more common now that I think I think it's just it's happening and it's going to happen. Um, so um, one project that we did recently that we've now published on is this this project that was funded partly by the Encyclopedia of Life and by the National Endowment for the Humanities, which was this project where we shared um, that I mentioned earlier um, over a dozen data sets from Anatolia. And um, the interesting thing about the um, getting that project going was that we worked with our colleague Ben Arbuckle, who's at University of North Carolina Chapel Hill now, and um, he had already for several years been talking with all these different researchers about doing this project. He he wanted to do a data sharing project. He was sort of getting the ball rolling, and he was establishing relationships with all of them, and they they trusted him because he had been working with them for years. And when the funding came through. It was sort of sudden, and all, and then he he told them, "Oh my gosh, here it's happening!" And they were already all on board because he had that previous relationship established with them. And that was something that we found very interesting: was that everybody jumped on and said, "Great, let's do it." And we were just surprised by that. We thought there'd be a little more reluctance um, to put data out there, but I think it had to do with the fact that there was this person who they trusted and who had already established that this was going to happen, and um, and it actually went really smoothly. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that, that sort of uh, the sort of personal networks of trust are really important in the whole thing. And the other thing was that the zooarchaeologists in that case all had an interest in seeing each other's data, too. Yeah. So um, this is so there are a couple of different motivations to, for people publishing with us. 
One is the sort of exhibitionism of individual researchers. Sometimes they want to show off how awesome their research is and the richness of the finds that they've got, the sort of sophistication of their recording. Those are the kinds of things that, you know, uh, data publishing can actually help demonstrate. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of um, sort of advertising uh, um, really the, the sort of the, the richness of your own research program. And then the second thing with the zooarchaeologists was that they were really interested in seeing each other's data and working with, it, with each other's data. And um, so they had a vested interest in, um, in, in collaborating with each other. And that was a sort of a tight knit community that was really fostered by Ben Arbuckle. To, to build up those collaborative ties, those ties of trust, and they had a mutual interest in, in seeing each other's research. Well, and increasingly another motivation, which is interesting to see now in recent years, is, is that people know it's something they should be doing. Yeah. <laughs> and so rather than having to be convinced or strong-armed into doing it, it's, it's more of a like, oh my God, I've got to get my data together and do it. I just, it's more of a time issue than anything, Yeah. I think. And have either of you two seen on kind of the back end of Open Context people reusing the data sets that maybe weren't original contributors uh, for, say, grad students doing a thesis or a dissertation? Yeah. So um, so with the Zoark data, um, one of the big things going on right now with that is that that data set uh, is being reused over and over again um, in teaching and um, also for different people wanting to write different uh, papers about it. So um, there, there's, a, there's a lot of activity around that one. Um, other activity that we see around open context is sort of reuse. Um, we've got, there have been classes using the API, uh, the application program interface, which is a way of getting machine readable data out of open context. And, and um, they've been essentially using that for developing, uh, say, geospatial data skills or web data skills. All right, so as far as the way we understand reuse, um, a lot of it is going to be anecdotal in the sense that um, what people tell us. So um, say when we were at conferences or we get email communications from people, uh, we, we hear about how the data that we publish gets reused. And a lot of it is being reused now for um, an instructional context, especially where some of the data that we've got available uh, people are teaching data analysis skills and um, research skills using primary data. So that's a really an important kind of area of reuse. We also know about people um, reusing the, uh, the data for research applications. They want to publish papers. So with that zooarchaeology data set in Anatolia, that is um, that, that initial publication came out in uh, PLOS One uh, over the summer. And um, some of the other people participating in that in that project, they want to publish other papers reusing that same data set, talking about other kinds of issues. Um, but we mainly understand these things anecdotally. Where the other area of reuse uh, could be learned, uh, where we could learn more, is if we would be collecting more information about, um, you know, in terms of web statistics and web analytics. The problem is that uh, we want to be very careful about web analytics because um, there are political sensitivities in archaeological data. And um, if we collect data about how individual users are using open context, these could be potentially um, uh, politically sensitive. It could get some people into trouble. And this is one of the reasons why we um, sort of adopt the uh, um, privacy guidelines that the American Library Association developed for um, uh, you patron data. Um, you, we want to make sure that we're collecting as little as possible about individuals because we, you never know how this information could be used against individuals. It's an important aspect of academic freedom. So this is going to be a, a slightly off topic of what we've been talking about question, but I, I've been thinking about this for a couple of minutes and wondering if each object or entry gets its own page how many entries are you guys up to i mean the, the website must be somewhat massive at this point yeah um we're um well in the, the next version we're exposing even more uh entities so we're, we're looking at around um 1.1 million uh different entities at the moment 
um, especially with the redesign in open context. So, um, yeah, there are scaling issues. And um, one uh, one, uh, really useful thing right now is that um, I'm working closely with the German Archaeological Institute, the DAI, which is part of the German Foreign Ministry. And um, they have pretty large scale computing facilities. And what we're doing now is um, uh, we're going to be deploying um, open context and its index on their cloud base, their, their cloud computing infrastructure. And so that's going to allow us to scale things better uh, and more cheaply than, we, than what we could do by ourselves. So um, with that, um, th- th- that'll allow the, our index to, to grow um, and it'll allow us to publish at that kind of granularity. Um, uh, uh, continue to do so without um, running into, you know, severe memory issues and that sort of thing. And are all these web pages searchable and open to the the internet? So in a sense, I could put in object and a certain number and find it through Google? Or um, is it something that some parts of it are open to the web, but some parts, obviously, if you have bots going through and and uh, going through 1.1 million uh, different pages, that can really take your server out. Yeah, for the most part, um, uh, we allow Google on everything. Um, the only thing that area we don't allow Google to go on is the uh, part of the website that runs the faceted search. Um, the faceted search is um, just to explain what faceted search is. It gives um, sort of a summary of uh, of the overall collection of the overall corpus um, in different areas of metadata. So um, one area of metadata would be say uh, context, right? So where is something found? Another area of metadata would be authorship, uh, project information, geospatial information are also different facets. Um, Computing those facets to count up how much stuff we have in those different of of those different kinds of categories, that's all pretty computationally um, expensive. And so we don't let Google crawl that. But the individual records of everything, um, we let Google crawl. Another aspect of that, though, is that, yes, everything in open context is open. Mm -hmm. Um, That just... Um, you made me think about that in terms of, we don't deal with so far we don't deal with information that needs to be kept um, private for some reason or whatever we've, we've, we've only focused on publishing data that can be totally open access and authors data contributors have to assure that they've collected the correct the proper um, approvals and, and, and you know agreements in order to have the data published openly yeah I mean one of the things is we don't um, being small we don't want to get into the liability issues of um, trying to manage permissions around potentially sensitive information, um, especially if, uh, in the context of, say, U.S. archaeology, hmm. where there are pretty strict laws regulating site locations and other aspects of uh, archaeological data. Um, we want to make sure that um, we're not in a situation where, you know, if open context gets hacked, then we would be legally liable for something because, um, you know, we, we, we definitely don't have the staff to try to um, work with the, the, the highest standards of IT security and that mm-hmm. type of thing. So there, 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 there are, um, we, we have to sort of, the openness is, you know, part of our mission, but it's also, the, there are practical issues associated with uh, sticking with open data in the sense that we want to make sure that we don't get into a realm of security issues that we don't have a, a personal uh, expertise or capacity to be able to handle. And having said that, we do work with data contributors to, um, you know, make sure that what it goes out on the web is what they want on the web. And so if they don't want their exact site location pinpointed, we will work with them to, you know, um, reduce the precision yeah. there. Yeah. Speaking of openness, you guys won a, or was recognized by the White House recently, or by recently, I think about a year ago. Did you guys get to go to the White House to receive your award? Yeah, we did. And that was pretty amazing and weird. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so the, what, the, the, the um, just a little bit of background about that. So in 2013, um, in a response to a public petition that was, uh, I think, signed by something like 65,000 people. The um, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, OSTP, um, uh, made a uh, uh, 
policy recommendation for um, open access to federally funded research. So um, if you're a, a research agency that has, I believe, a budget of over uh, um, $100 million a year or something like that, then you're required now by the, by the White House, this is an executive order, to um, make sure that the publication outcomes of that research are available openly um, without restriction. And um, the specific implementation of, of that new order is still up in the, up in the air. But part of that recommendation from the OSTP uh, also includes some discussion about open data. And um, the uh, White House, in making that announcement, also wanted to uh, recognize uh, different um, you know, activists, basically, uh, people who've been active in trying to promote um, more transparency and openness in, in uh, science. And we were uh, recognized as one of the, actually, the, the, the one other person, um, uh, uh, from uh, he's now at the uh, University of Pennsylvania, um, uh, Bill, uh, Will. yeah, Will Knoll, sorry. Um, he's, uh, he did, does some amazing work with um, imagery of epigraphy, of, of, of uh, papyrus and, 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 and documents. Uh, we were two people recognized who were mainly funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. And so NEH was really thrilled about this too, because, um, you know, uh, along with like the Human Genome Project and the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, all of these really big science kinds of initiatives from funded by Nas the National Institutes for Health and the National Science Foundation, which have budgets that are orders of magnitude bigger than NEH. Uh, NEH had two people re uh, um, recognized there at the White House, and that was kind of a thrill to have the humanities represented. Yeah, and this is out of, a, a, there. I think there were 13 people who were recognized, and Eric was among those 13, Eric, and this other guy, Will, um, who were the well, no, sort of yeah. humanities folks. Um, and this, it's called Champions, it was called Champions of Change and Open Science, and it's part of the, White House does a whole Champions of Change program, and I don't know if it's still going on, but it was going on for at least a year where they were recognizing people who are, make, who are changing things and making an impact in their communities in various areas. And so the open science thing came out of, I think, this the OSTP um, mandate that Eric mentioned. Um, and it was, yeah, they had a panel and they it's online. They had a, a whole like sort of hour long panel discussion with all these people. And the president, unfortunately, was not there. And we had flown back, actually, from Germany to go to this thing. And he, it turns out, had flown to Germany to do something else. So we missed him. <laughs> uh, the future of Open Context. What are you guys' plans for the future? And what are some things coming down the pipeline fairly soon? Well, I mean, yeah. There's, um, we would love actually to expand because we're actually getting to the point now where um, we're getting much more uh, um, data, uh, people wanting to publish with us. Um, we're working with now um, the site file managers from uh, many of the U.S. Uh, 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 states, uh, uh, SHPO offices, state site file managers. They're publishing uh, site file databases with us. And uh, so we're, we're, we're starting to need to, need to uh, worry about like scaling things up. And so, uh, you know, on the technical side, um, cloud computing is definitely one of the things that we're actively working on right now. Um, we're working on a very new version of open context that's using Python as the scripting language, using Django as a programming framework and Postgres as a, a backend database and Apache Solar for doing facet search. All of those are neat, really neat kinds of technologies that kind of scale well. Um, and what's going to happen is that um, we're going to have data that we're publishing that's going to be a lot cleaner. Um, it's going to be using um, much more updated web standards that are going to be uh, really useful for um, people do, wanting to do geospatial things and to do linked data things. So that's what's going on on the technical side. On the non-technical side, um, organizationally, we're actually um, really wanting to um, develop much more of, um, you know, you know, finding ways of finance and giving away other people's data for free. <laughs> and um, part of that is, um, you know, developing more ties with the library communities to make sure that um, data management, um, granting budgets and things like that can help support this kind of thing. But the other side of th this 
is um, honestly we're probably uh, needing to raise um, some uh, something of an endowment actually to help sustain this kind of thing. And so we're actually starting to uh, um, build up an effort in that kind of an area to um, help subsidize and underwrite the costs of uh, the editorial processes, the data cleanup, the technology development, all the sorts of things that have to go into um, uh, making uh, uh, high quality data accessible. Yeah, because this is, I'm sure, what, you know, listeners are going to wonder, how is this kind of thing maintained? And then we get that question a whole lot. And for it, since its inception, we've had a variety of um, support from, you know, private and, and um, federal granting agencies. And we've done some consulting and we've now we're actually getting a bit of revenue from people actually putting um, data publishing costs and archiving costs into their into their grant applications. So there are a variety of ways of funding this thing, but you know, so far we have, we write a lot of grant applications, <laughs> and so we are really exploring ways that we can make this a more permanent um, thing that we can focus on doing the work rather than writing quite so many grant applications year to year. And could you go into a little more detail about what? So you guys are talking about starting an endowment? Yeah, um, we're uh, in the. You know, this is this is an area that. Um, Ultimately, um, open data is in some ways one of the kind of almost a perfect public good, right? In the sense that um, if a data is open, if it has no copyright or legal restrictions associated with it, if it has um, um, no restrictions around like techni technically around formats or anything like that, it can flow anywhere and be used by anybody and reused by anybody. And um, the big challenge in that is um, how one um, does that uh, sustainably, because um, most cost recovery mechanisms, say associated with traditional conventional publishing, you know, where you have like a subscription access charge or something like that, those kinds of ways of financing dissemination uh, don't work well with data because they break the utility, they break the value of the data. And so we need to find a way of financing open data because open data is the most valuable kind of data. And um, so ultimate, ultimately, that means that we can't charge subscriptions. We can't do a lot of the conventional approaches of sort of market monetization. And uh, to sustain this, an endowment is um, one, one, one strategy. Now, we do, what we're trying to do with that is that it doesn't necessarily need to support all of our operating costs. Right. So uh, essentially a mixed model of having an endowment to help underwrite part of it and then um, uh, other cost recovery coming in through data management charges, that type of thing. That's probably the realistic approach. Uh, and, um, you know, if we can if we can raise a bit of money to help um, sort of main, maintain basic operation um, with a revenue stream from um, our publishing activities, sustaining public um, basic revenue, then we can the grants and everything like that can be used for doing the important bits of like new technologies, expanding that's that sort of thing. So um, yeah, we're we're in the middle right now of cultivating donors. So it's uh, if you, if you know of any, send them our way. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much. That was Sarah and Eric from Open Context. This was another episode of Archaeotech Podcast. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Doug. And thank you so much, Russell. Thanks for having us. Still recording on paper in the field? Hate having to process hundreds of site records when you get back to the office and would rather go straight to report writing and research? DigTech has the answer. Hi, I'm Chris Webster, founder of DigTech LLC, a disabled veteran-owned CRM firm and archaeological technology research and development firm. At DigTech, we're creating applications for smartphones and tablets that will increase efficiency in the field and will keep archaeologists doing what they love, archaeology, and will reduce the amount of busy work in the office. Some of what we do involves enhancing existing third-party applications that are already on the app stores. Use our consultation form on the website at www.digtech-llc.com forward slash tablet, and we'll help you figure out what digital solution is best for you. The cost of going digital is a lot less than you think, and once you do it, you'll wonder why you ever recorded on paper to begin with. Contact Chris over at DigTech, the parent company of the Archaeology Podcast Network, today, and let DigTech help you save paper, save time, save resources, and go digital. Now, back to the show.
That's it for another episode of the Archaeotech Podcast. Links to some of the items mentioned on the show are in the show notes for this podcast, which can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash archaeotech. If you like the show and want to comment, please do. You can leave comments about this or any other episode on the website or on the iTunes page for this episode. You can also email us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com or use the contact form on the podcast webpage. If you'd like us to answer a question on a future episode, email us. Use the contact form on the website or tweet your questions with the hashtag archaeotech or tag at artpodnet in your tweet. Please share the link to this show wherever you saw it. If you'd like to subscribe to this podcast, you can do so on iTunes or on Stitcher Radio. You can also type the name of the podcast into your favorite podcasting app and subscribe that way. Don't forget to go over to iTunes and leave a review of the show. It helps us get noticed so more people can find our podcast and benefit from the content. Also, send us show suggestions and interview suggestions. We want this to be a resource for field technicians everywhere, and we want to know what you want to know about. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.